in the Old Testament refers to a skill. Skill, according to modern day in, uh, definition, it means a learned ability to carry out a task with predetermined results. So it's a skill, has, it's, it's something that you have, it's an ability to carry out a task with predetermined results. Now you and I understand that if we're going to have God's wisdom concerning a matter in which we're going through as far as a trial is concerned, understanding it in context as we talk about uh, not only wisdom, but today God's perspective on economy, we have to realize that between verse 2 and verse 12, there's, there's, uh, there's this portion that's parenthesized by those two verses. In verse 2 it says, Consider it all joy when you go through various trials. Verse 12 says, Blessed are those who endure trials. So realizing that between verse 2 and verse 12, we're talking about trials. We're talking about having God's wisdom in trials and God's perspective on economy concerning trials. That's how I'm going to phrase it because we're going to look at those who have and those who have not. You know, those who are poor and those who are wealthy. And how do they also deal with trials and what's God's perspective on that? You know, it's trials concerning the wisdom. It's that skill that you and I are capable of having that God is willing to bless us with if we turn to him, if we turn to his word, if we trust his spirit living within us. God will give us the supernatural ability to have joy irregardless of the pain and suffering, discomfort that we go through as we experience a trial. That is the work of God. It's not natural to have joy when you're going through difficulties. But it is supernaturally necessary as Christians that we experience joy when we go through difficult times. And God provides that for us. And it's a, an acquired skill. Although he gives you his presence by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I must open God's word. And then from there, as God speaks to us, we get his perspective on the trials that we're going through. And now we're going to look at his perspective on the economy. Not the economy I'm talking about as far as living in America. But God's perspective. And that's what I want. I hope you want God's perspective no matter what you're going through. And God will give it to you. Remember Joseph? As I told you back in chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. When Joseph went through all that difficulty in his life. And he's standing before his brothers after he reveals himself to them. He's, and you remember what his brothers did to him. They left him for dead. And sold him to a caravan of travelers going to Egypt. And went back and reported that their brother was dead to their, to their dad. And Joseph says to them in chapter 50, when he's in front of them, he says, what you meant for harm, I have God's perspective. And what was God's perspective? God meant it for good. When Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 prayed three times that God would remove the thorn in the flesh. I'm telling you, I had that prayer this week. Going through those kidney, that kidney stone, I, I'm thinking, Lord, remove this thorn from my flesh, or just the stone would be good. Uh, but he hasn't yet. I still have it. But the point is this. Paul prayed. And what did God do? Did God remove that thorn in his flesh? Did he bring heal? No, he said, my grace is sufficient. And then Paul said, now I got God's perspective. I will have strength in my weakness. You see, you and I can also gain the skill by being in God's word, trusting his spirit to give us God's perspective on no matter what we go through so that we might have joy. Why would we have joy? Because we know God's going to walk with us through that trial. And we know that on the other side, God is going to somehow grow us as followers of His and also bring glory and honor to His name. Now, what we did in these trials, we looked at a contrasting sort of way of perceiving trials and wisdom and also economy. That's what we're going to look at today. 
We, we looked at how Christians go through trials and how non-Christians go through trials. And there's a difference. We looked at God's wisdom versus man's wisdom. Certainly, the two are diametrically opposed. And now we're going to have God's perspective on riches and the natural man and how he considers riches or material possessions. Now, in our world today, especially in America, our economy is sort of going along the, the way of social justice in this sense. We have a, a democratic society that wants to practice some sort of redistribution of wealth. And the way that is accomplished, you tax those who have, and then you provide a welfare for those who don't have. That's basically what it boils down to. It's called social justice or redistribution of wealth. That's how our country is, is wanting to work. Now, that's man's perspective. Is that God's perspective? Does God say, let's take it from the wealthy and give it to the poor? Not at all. God recognizes that in this world, we're going to have those who have been given much and those who have very little. Now, I hope you know in this world, as Americans, we have been blessed with a whole lot. As a small percentage of the people, we have most of the world's wealth. So I hope as you're sitting here today, don't consider yourself poor. If you go somewhere in this world, for those who are struggling just to eat, you'll find out quickly you are very wealthy. But nevertheless, in this world, Jesus said to his disciples, when they had this perfume, and the woman broke the perfume bottle open, which was probably a year's wages, and poured it over Jesus' feet. And what did Jesus say to her, to the, the guys when they said, we could have took that perfume and sold it and took the money and gave it to the poor. Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. You will always have the poor with you. So understand this, folks. We're going to have poor Christians and we're going to have wealthy Christians. That's how God views this sort of economy. Now, this is going to make, I hope this makes a point as we get through this. So it makes more sense. See, spiritual man, you and I, from God's perspective as spiritual men and women, we see what true riches really are. It's not what you own, but it's who owns you. We know that we belong to God. The joy of knowing that I'm a child of God, that's enormous as far as riches are concerned. It doesn't, light doesn't get any better than that. We understand what true riches really are. We understand that the material things that we have today are what? Temporal, right? You know the old saying, you've never seen a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It's, it's not about those who gain the most toys who win. Those who have come to Christ are the ones who truly win. We know that as spiritual Christians. We know what has lasting value. We know what cannot be tarnished or cannot be stolen and cannot rot. We know what can be stored up in heaven that will be there for eternity. So that's how we're going to see the economy from God's perspective. And we've got to keep that in mind, especially as we go through trials. Now, in your outline, let's look at these verses. And I outlined it with number one. Roman numeral number one, first thing I want you to look at. Some Christians are poor. Now, after I already shared with you that you and I probably have in America most of the wealth of the world, you, you cannot say you're poor this morning. Did you eat this morning? You should have, right, if you didn't. Do you have a house, a roof over your head, transportation to get here, pretty decent gas prices right now? Well, that's pretty exciting. You've got it made. A couple of years ago, I went to Mozambique and taught pastors in Mozambique. I spent, there, I spent two weeks there, and I'm telling you what, you talk about poverty. I mean, you know the kids played soccer. 
they used a water bottle, an old water bottle for their soccer ball. 